still license renewed. Yeah, perfect. This is going to take forever. Sometimes the hardest part of getting your license renewed is just finding a seat at the BMV. the old license renewed today. Uh, driver's license renewed. <laughs> have you ever noticed that you've got to get your driver's license renewed every four years, but you don't have to get your marriage license renewed ever? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I mean, you, you think, think there'd at least be some, some kind of an eye test, test to make sure you can still see well enough to be married. You know, yeah. <laughs> Have to look through the little machine. All right, Mr. Brannion, can you see your socks on the floor? <laughs> oh, the written test. The written test will be given to you without a pencil. It'll be up to you to find one. <laughs> I could go through a different room and find nothing. My wife could go through the same room, find two pencils, a pen, and a box of crayons. <laughs> All in the seat cushions. You ever notice that two guys can sit next to each other real close together and never acknowledge the other one's presence? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, look at us. Here, we're sitting a few inches apart. I'm pretending like you're not here. You're doing the same thing. But women don't do that. Mm -mm -mm. Women, my wife, my wife can strike up a conversation with anyone at any time for any reason. She oh, love that jacket. Neiman Marcus, right? It is Neiman Marcus. How did you know? I saw it in the catalog last year. Where'd you get it? We got it in New York when we visited my sister. Your sister lives in New York. Are you kidding me? You went through here. We did. We visited her and her husband. Her husband. She's married. You got pictures. You got pictures of the kids. Pictures. Pictures. A matter of two minutes and people mistake her for sisters. <laughs> or the phone, the phone will ring at our house and Lori will scoop it up out of the cradle. Hello? Mm hmm. Sure. I know. All right, that's no problem, sweetie. Mm hmm. John does the same thing. Yep. All right. Yeah, we'll talk later. Mm hmm. Bye bye. I'm like, who's that? Wrong number. I think the problem is that guys just can't come up with an intelligent opening line. Wasn't even trying. <laughs> well, go ahead and try. You see? It's not your fault. I've only known one guy. I've only known one guy in my life who could even try to keep up with the woman in his life when it came to conversation and stuff. And that was my great-grandfather, great-grandpa Frank. Man, he and my great-grandmother Mamie had this little thing that they worked out. It was almost like a routine. Mamie would say stuff to us boys like, hey, you boys, don't put your fingers in your nose. Don't put your finger in your nose. And great-grandpa would be behind her and he'd say, if you're not supposed to put your finger in your nose, why does it fit? What number do you have? I got number uh, 940. How about you? 937. Perfect. <laughs> That'll give us a chance to work it out. Work it out? Yeah, work out this whole men and women thing. Husbands, wives, love, relationship. Figure it all out. I can't just sit here and read. No. <laughs> you know, I've been, 
I've been married for 21 years. Same person. And I think that the secret to a long-term relationship is flexibility, adaptation. You've got to pretty much bend with the wind or it'll just knock you flat. <laughs> because it's always in a state of flux. It's always changing. I mean, after 21 years, she's not the same girl that I married. The relationship is a lot more intense. She asks me questions. <laughs> Questions that I don't know the answers to. Because they are questions that no man has ever known the answers to. <laughs> Deep, probing, impossible questions. What are you thinking? I'm a guy. I'm thinking nothing. <laughs> Zero, zilt, zip, nada, nothing. She's a girl. Girls cannot think nothing. That never happens. When her mind is blank, there's still billions of calculations flying through it. Angles being considered, thoughts being processed and organized, colors being coordinated. She's like a 4 gigahertz, 256 terabyte file serving computer. I'm like that little solar calculator that comes free with cigarettes. <laughs> and I still spend time with other guys. You know, me and the guys go out, we talk. Never once have I ever said, Hey, Al, what you thinking? <laughs> because I don't care. <laughs> Plus, he's a guy. I know what he's thinking. Nothing. <laughs> Has this ever happened to you? Saturday morning, I'm minding my own business on my way out to mow the yard or something. And she stops me. <gasps> Are you going to wear that outside? <laughs> I'm just going to mow. What's the big deal? Look at your shirt. Look at your pants. Look at those socks. I don't want the neighbors to see you looking like that. <laughs> Sunday morning, I come out the same door on the way to church. She stops me again for an appraisal of her outfit. Okay, sweetheart. How do I look? Like, why are you asking me? I'm not qualified to dress myself. There's so many things that we men are not qualified to do, but the tasks themselves continue to fall to us. For centuries, they've fallen to us. We don't know how to do them. We don't know how to fix things. We're supposed to. We're supposed to be innate. I say, oh, look, John. Look, John, around the house. All of our stuff is broken. All of our stuff is... <laughs> Mustard. <laughs> so fix it. I know one electronic repair maneuver. <laughs> so I do for everything. VCR's broken. <laughs> Microwaves on the fritz. <laughs> I'm positive the first semester of medical school, all they do is teach the male doctors not to walk into the room and say, how do you feel, Mr. Smith? You still sick? <laughs> She wants to borrow stuff from me that I never have, like tissue and Kleenex. Can I borrow a tissue? John, you need a tissue. Can I have a tissue, sweetie? Hmm? No, men don't carry Kleenex. To a guy, carrying Kleenex and wearing long sleeves is redundant. Let's face it, if men carry Kleenex, this pff, would never been invented. <laughs> once, once, once every, every millennium or so, like clockwork, she'll actually assign me a project that falls within my tiny little sphere of things that I'm capable of. And I get so excited because I can finally demonstrate to her I'm not completely without purpose. And she'll be like, uh, Sweetheart, sweetheart, I've got a little headache right there. Ouch. <laughs> Would you be a dear and give me an aspirin? 
And I'm like, aspirin? Yes! But so I can get you an aspirin. I can do that. You'll be so proud of me. You'll be happy you married me. No, don't leave. Run down the hall to the medicine cabinet. I find the aspirin. Childproof cap. Here, you do it. (laughs) I can't even take my own temperature when I don't feel well, because trying to read that glass thermometer, it's like looking into a crystal ball. I handed it to her, and she said, this is the baby thermometer. things. I can't operate Tupperware. I can't operate Tupperware. I I have no idea. I can't operate Ziploc bags. It's like, it's simple. Look, yellow and and blue make green. You just zip it. Look, it just zips. It's simple. You just zip it. Simple simple for her. She's got zippers that zip up in the back of the dresses. What's that? We just make it more challenging. Well, my zippers are in the front. I still forget to close them. Probably the most difficult times in the relationship are the holidays. That seems to be, that seems to be when the relationship is the most strained because there's nothing like a big celebration to bring out rage in the loved ones. <laughs> it's my idea to take our two-year-old this year to see the Easter Bunny. My idea, because I didn't think we had enough pictures of her crying. <laughs> and I figured out something that's been a mystery to parents forever, which is why is the, why is the Easter Bunny so scary to little kids? Well, we also took her to the state fair. The prior summer, she toddled up to the rabbit cage, stuck her finger right between the bars, and I was freaking out. Hey, don't stick your finger in there! (gasps) Sweetheart, that rabbit will bite your finger! Right off! (laughs) Then we took her to the mall, where there's a rabbit five times her size. (laughs) Come on, Daddy's going to put you on the bunny's lap! Santa Claus is just as scary. It's just as terrifying to sit on Santa's lap, but at least you get what you ask for for Christmas after you go through that whole ordeal. Easter Bunny doesn't work like that. You sit on Bunny's lap all day, and he's never going to bring you a mini bike. So it's going to be the same thing. Big basket full of chocolate and those stupid peeps. You know what I'm talking about? Little pink Siamese chickens all stuck together. And the- My sister, my sister loves those. Every year, she's like, oh, I just love Easter because it's the only time here we can get these. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you can't put your hands on stale marshmallows and sugar just any time of the year. I... <laughs> my wife's favorite holiday is Christmas. Lori's favorite time of the year is Christmas. She loves it. She loves it. Every year, every year, the beginning of October. <laughs> and she starts in, what are we going to do about the tree? <laughs> hmm? I'm going, sweetheart, it's October. It's been up this long.
The very, very first year that we got married, prior to the actual ceremony itself, the men of the family pulled me aside and gave me responsibilities. John, it's a man's job. It's a man's job to establish holiday traditions. It's your job to set forth Christmas traditions that the family will observe for generations. So I cut our own Christmas tree, which is a tradition that we have quit. Because it is a hassle. It's so hard. It's too hard. Just trying to find the perfect tree out there that everybody will agree is a symbol of Yuletide festivities. First year we did it, I lucked out. We found a great tree, two houses down, right in the front yard. <laughs> it already had lights on it. it was pretty But the thing is, Christmas, Christmas isn't a time for just the immediate family to come together for tradition's sake. No, no who. Extended family as well, loved ones from all sectors of the galaxy. <laughs> Gather together at one place and one time for one purpose, friction. It's been that way since I was little. I remember when I was really small, my brother David and I would pile into the back seat of the car on the way to grandma's house. And mom from the front seat would make the same Christmas speech every year. <laughs> All right, boys. This year, let's see if we can make it all the way to your grandmother's house without the two of you squabbling and fighting and bickering and driving your father crazy and making a bunch of noise and bickering and squabbling and fighting and squabbling and bickering. <laughs> two or three blocks into the soldier, and my little brother would start in. Hey, you're on my side of the car. Yes, you are. Look where your pinky's at. It's over on my side. You know where the line is. It's right there. You're clearly over the line. Throw it around me. So stop throwing it around me or I'm going to kill mom. And mama go, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> All right, boys, for the rest of the trip, no more talking to each other. Both of you keep it quiet. boys <laughs> for the rest of your lives no more looking at each other ever both, both of you sit on your hands and shut your eyes he's breathing up all the air from my side of the car breathing up all my air then she go bananas and just start swinging at us over the back seat. That's it, I've had it. I'm not gonna. You don't have to pull over, Bob. Just keep driving. I can handle this. And, she's just at it. and her arm would get all wrapped up in the seat belt, locked down to her side. And she couldn't get it. So seat belts really do save lives. And as much of a burden, as much of a burden as it is to have siblings, you know, little brothers and sisters, there are, there are those on the planet who don't have them and for some reason seek them out. I actually got a call from the Big Brothers organization asking me to volunteer to take some little guy out and show him what it's like to have an older brother. <laughs> I went, really? You want me to pick up this kid at his house, bring him back to my house, make fun of his clothes, shove him down, rub dirt in his hair, give him Indian burns. How does an organization like that even get funding? <laughs> Fortunately, I'm an expert at being the oldest, oldest at being the big brother. I was 
born first, then three, and managed to stay there. <laughs> it wasn't as simple as the younger siblings made it out to be. I mean, my little brother and sister thought my life was cake just because I was born first, and they were constantly in my face. Oh, sure, Mr. Whoopie-Doo, big shot, born first. <laughs> Mom and Dad treat you special, give you everything you asked for just because you were born first. <laughs> first. You don't have to come inside when the street lights are on, it's dark out. You can see the moon and stars and space and darkness. And you don't have to hold anybody's hand and look both ways when you cross the street. I don't think you have to look at all when you cross the street, do you? No, you put a sock in your head if you want to. And run back and forth, and 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 back and forth. And you never get in trouble. And you don't have to eat all your vegetables at supper time and clean your plate. Oh, look, there's vegetables on my plate. I'm Mr. Whoopi Doo. Big job, boy. First, I'll just, I'll just flick them off. Flick, 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 flick. Mom and Dad can be dessert anyway. Sometimes they even give you a ice cream. I know they have. I've seen it. <laughs> and you don't. You don't have to wear hand-me-down clothes. Right. I always got to pick my clothes fresh off the rack at Goodwill. <laughs> Little kids never had to do what I did as the oldest. I was the one who had to stand with Mom at every single garage sale while she went. Bingo. <laughs> this is exactly what we were looking for, John. You can't even find these in the store. Discontinued in 1953. <laughs> Outlawed in two states. She's got a whole box of them here for a nickel. Let's see if she's got a place where you can try them on. <laughs> box of corduroys for a nickel. <laughs> Who cares if they fit? Let's just dust with them. <laughs> but ultimately, being part of a family means going to a family reunion. And a family reunion, a family reunion doesn't have to be a bad experience. If you follow my simple rule, don't go to your family reunion. <laughs> But sometimes you can't help it, like when you're married. When you're married, you have to go to the in-law's reunion, because if you don't show up, then they'll think you don't like them, and you don't want them to know that for sure. <laughs> sometimes it's unavoidable, like when, you know, when you're married. And this year, Lori's, Lori's reunion was at her Uncle Jack's, and Lori's Uncle Jack owns lakefront property, has a little cottage right down on the waterfront, and that's where the reunion was this year. And so as everyone was arriving at the reunion, Jack was standing down next to the boat on the end of the pier, insisting that we all come and look at it. Brand new speedboat. Had to look at it because it was a beauty, absolute beauty. Hey, old Jack got a new speedboat this year. There she is, beauty, beauty of a boat. You ain't never seen a boat quite like this one. She's beauty, beauty. Bass Tracker magazine quote. You know what the Bass Tracker said? Beauty, beauty of a boat. <laughs> If I was to pick one word to describe this boat, I would have to pick the word beauty. <laughs> B-U-T-Y. <laughs> e. <laughs> beauty. John, come here. Take a look at that boat. What do you think of her? Hey, that's a beauty, Uncle Jack. You bet she is, boy. She'll do 600 miles an hour. Hop in, I'm going to teach you how to ski. <laughs> so I jumped into the boat next to Jack. My, my brother-in-law's come running down the hill. They're all excited. Come on, get in the boat. He's going to teach John to ski. It's going to be fun to watch. Come on. He'll probably die. <laughs> and out we go with Jack driving wide open. <laughs> And since I'm new to this whole boat experience, Jack is shouting stuff at me as we fly along, so I won't be a scared. 
those are just waves, John. Don't be uh, scared. <laughs> Remember lily pads. Nothing to worry about. <laughs> That was a sailboat. <laughs> now, into that scenario with a lunatic behind the wheel, they stop the boat in the middle of the lake and they throw two skis. Push. Push. <laughs> I figured you were counting. And the skis are one size fit all. Remember that, because it's crucial. And then they throw me push, out in the middle of the lake. At that point, everybody in the boat jumps to their feet and just starts shouting at me. Random pieces of helpful advice for how to ski. Which sounds like... Decapitation. Dismemberment. It basically boils down into three things. One, you have to keep your arms straight out in front of you. Two, you have to keep your knees close together. <laughs> and three, the first two things are impossible. <laughs> I take hold of the rope. Jack guns the boat. <laughs> The skis, one size fits all, are gone. <laughs> I am face down. <laughs> and there's no helpful advice like, hey, let go. <laughs> and I discovered that the human nose will hold two and a half gallons of water. <laughs> when it is properly inserted. <laughs> After I fell, they made a big circle in the boat, came around and threw me the rope again. And everybody on board is real encouraging because, you know, they're my family. They're rooting for me to get up and try again because they want to videotape the next spectacular crash. Hey, that was pretty good for your first time, John. Really, really good. We were all talking, all of us in the boat. We think with just a little more practice, you are going to be a fine skier. <laughs> sh sh shut up. I know. He can hear you. <laughs> Let me give you a little bit of advice this time, Scooter. You take hold of the rope, and this time when Jack pops you up out of the water, you just stay squatted down on those skis. This will change your life. <laughs> Hang, hanging on as long as you need to, till you're comfortable enough you can stand up straight. <laughs> Take hold of the rope. Jack guns the boat. <laughs> I discovered that I have another opening in my body <laughs> that will hold more water than my nose. <laughs> when it's properly inserted. Jack makes another big circle, comes around, and they throw me a rope again. I open my mouth to shriek, get me out! And you can see the tag from my swimming trunks, right? <laughs> and they were not Speedos when I put them on. I guess what I'm saying is I've never really been much of a fitter inner. I've never been a belonger. In high school, it was that way growing up, all the way through high school. The car I drove in high school was a brown Chevy Vega. 
two doors and three speeds. And that was a chick magnet. It's a poor man's pinto. And girls would say things to me, you know, to try to make me feel better. You know how girls do. They'd say stuff to boost my spirits, try to let me down easy. It's like a ton of bricks. <laughs> oh, I care about you, John. I care about you. I think about you like a brother. <laughs> so I had no girlfriends in high school. But I had more sisters than the Catholic Church. <laughs> And then a couple of years after graduation, this miracle, along came Lori, along came this girl, and she said, I love you. I really love you. <laughs> I should have been suspicious right there. <laughs> I should have known I was in over my head, and we started planning the wedding, planning the wedding. We had to have a wedding rehearsal. That's what she told me. got to have a wedding rehearsal, John. I'm like, why? Is it tricky? She goes, yes, it's tricky. Let me show you my part. We rehearsed this over and over again. Let me show you my part in the wedding. <laughs> By the sixth time, I had it down. <laughs> what I didn't know was all the stuff that weddings entail. I didn't know all the details that the women built into this ceremony. and Everything had to be done perfectly or else the whole affair would be ruined. Like the organist had to play exactly the right song in a perfect cadence to allow the bridesmaids or the groomsmen to come together in the back of the church and link elbows and march in perfect synchronicity down the center aisle on that rug that we unrolled all the way to the front of the church. And we unrolled that because, well, because it was rolled up in the back of the church. And I guess OSHA has a policy or something. And all the colors, all the colors had to match everything. The, the flowers that the bridesmaids carry had to match the dresses that they wore, which had to match the cummerbunds on the groomsmen's tuxes, which had to match their corsages, which had to match the bridesmaids' boutonnieres, which had to match the bridesmaids' eye color, which matched the upholstery in the car that we drove and the labels on the cans dragging along behind. And the, <laughs> the sky factored in somehow and the, the curvature of the earth had to be considered with the refraction of light off of semi-permeable membranes during the summer equinox. And, MIT guys flew out from Boston and did all the math. <laughs> and then the little flower girl came out. She had a basket full of petals. And represented in that basket was every color visible to the naked human eye, perfectly balanced to represent the harmony that is true love. <laughs> and she just started chucking them out, just flinging petals. <laughs> We had to stop her. No, you can't just fling the petals anywhere. They have to be equally spaced apart from one another. Because the mother-in-laws came out with tape measures. And... <laughs> Made sure there weren't more petals on the bride side than on the groom side. Because that would cause a huge <laughs> fight. And then the little ring bearer, little ring bearer came out with his cummerbund, his tux. He had the ring tied to a satin pillow. And the ring is so very important that it just made sense to give it to a three-year-old. <laughs> yeah, the day before, he swallowed a nickel and two pennies. Here's the ring. Yeah. And I don't mind practicing. I don't. I just wish we would have spent time rehearsing something that was going to happen more than once. <laughs> One time. That's all we do. It. Hours and hours went into sweat equity to becoming the quintessential groom, which is a role I have mastered. <laughs> I do it in my sleep. But there's never been another command performance. There's never been another chance to publicly demonstrate my... The minister's never called up at church on a Saturday night. Hey, John, we've had a last-minute groom dropout. It's your big chance, buddy. Suit up and come do that voodoo that you do. Oh, oh it's a wasted skill. Like, like the metric system. 
We never used that. Remember when we were kids in metric system? Well, you got to learn the metric system. Teachers would say, you got to learn the metric system. By the time you grow up, there's just going to be metric everything. There won't be any miles or inches or feet or anything. It's just going to be metric, metric, metric. <laughs> Blah. <laughs> yeah, the metric caught on like wildfire, didn't it? <laughs> we couldn't buy soda pop without it. Take me to your leader. <laughs> I, don't mind. I don't mind rehearsing. I just wish we would practice something. There were so many things I needed practice on. There were so many things I didn't know how to do. Still don't know how to do them. Consequently, 20 years later, I'm still... I could have used practice on a thousand things. I could have used, used practice dropping off to sleep at night with a pair of sub-zero feet in my back. <laughs> you have frostbitten my kidneys. I could have used practice standing in the women's clothing department in front of the dressing room door, holding her purse, trying to, trying to hang on to a shred of masculine dignity. And even getting used to each other, just occupying the same sleeping space at the same time, that's what's difficult, getting used to each other's nuances. She's a morning person. She's a morning person. The sun barely breaks over the horizon. She's hovering over the bed. <gasps> Looks like we had the sun's up. The sky is blue. The birds are singing. It's going to be a great day. It's time to get up, 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 up. You know what I would rather hear at 6 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> Everyone on the ground, this is a stick-up. Because <laughs> at least the stick-up guys will let you lay down. <laughs> the, birds, the birds are singing. That is the only sound that they know how to make. You know what I think? I think one bird gets up early, and the noise outside the window is all the other birds going, Shut up! <laughs> and even climbing into bed together, occupying the same sleeping space takes... You know, she's my wife. I, lo I love her. But there are still times when... All right. Mm. I will climb into bed next to her. I pull her over close. I can smell her perfume. Start to kiss the back of her neck, blow in her ear. She looks over at me and says, What are you thinking? I don't know. What are you thinking? <laughs> she goes, I was just thinking that if we fold the dish towel small. <laughs> they will fit more efficiently into the kitchen drawer. That is exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> Let's go do it now. <laughs> Maybe while we're up, I can spackle. <laughs> and 
And then into the relationship came the children. We had four babies, somehow. <laughs> Spackling accident. <laughs> and that changes everything. I learned so much. I learned that they separate pregnancy. I learned to separate pregnancy into three things called trimesters. And the reason they're called trimesters is because during that time, the husband tries to mester up the strength. To, <laughs> to stay in the house with a pregnant woman. <laughs> the first, first trimester, first trimester, two cells come together, form a tiny human being. The second trimester, that tiny human being begins to grow. And in the third trimester, the pregnant woman changes from a human being <laughs> into a Tasmanian devil. <laughs> and so I come in the front door and she's boom, back, back, and walking, 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 and walking. Hey, where, where's the cat? Uh. <laughs> And it was at that, it was at that moment in my life when I realized this is not the same girl that I married. This is not the same species that I married. After just a couple of years of marriage, you start to see sides of each other that are kept hidden when you're dating. When we dated, she never devoured small domesticated mammals. I would have remembered that. At the same time, there's parts. There's parts of becoming a new father that aren't completely terrifying, kind of heartwarming. Like when she was about six months along into the first pregnancy, she developed this, this intense desire to learn everything she could about becoming a mother, carrying children, raising children, because it was our baby. It was my baby. <laughs> and she wanted to do it perfectly. This is your baby, John, living inside of me. Sucking the life out of my organs like a parasite. <laughs> Making me blow like a fish on the beach. <laughs> Doing backflips on my bladder all because of you. I <laughs> love. So she went to the library, she got books on the subject, she checked out videotapes, she subscribed to magazines. And so by the time the babies arrived, we were perfect parents. She, because of months of loving maternal research, and me by default. Because <laughs> I had her to explain everything to me, all the stuff I had to know. Like trading off feedings in the middle of the night, baby cry, and she'd nudge me. John, baby's crying. <laughs> Do you hear that crying baby? That is your baby. <laughs> the book says that daddy should take a turn feeding for bonding. So bond! <laughs> so I would stumble down the hall into the kitchen looking for bottles and then it would occur to me, hey, we're breastfeeding. <laughs> This is going to hurt like a monkey. We did ultrasound. We did ultrasound because we had to know if it was going to be. We have to know if this is going to be a boy or a girl, John. I was like, why? That's like opening your presents on the 23rd of December. Let's just, <laughs> just wait and see what comes out. Sploosh. Hey, look at there. We weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> no, we have to know what color to paint the nursery. 
What nursery? Well, right now, it's your office. <laughs> I'd never even seen an ultrasound machine before, but I had seen Doppler radar on the Weather Channel. <laughs> it's the exact same instrument. So. Lori's stretched down on the table, the doctor's doing the exam, and she can't see the screen, so she's yelling at me, what is it? What is it? What is it? I'm looking at the screen, uh, it's a cold front. It's like the baby's over Canada. <laughs> and the thing is, at that point in life, you know, at that point in the relationship, I didn't want to be dumb. I wanted, didn't want to be, I wanted to be the go-to guy, you know, the pillar, the rock. I wanted, to, I wanted to be able to take her by the hand and say, hey, I know you're scared, sweetie. First time, but you and me, we are going to sojourn into this parenthood thing together. You can trust me. I know exactly where I'm going. <laughs> I was late getting up to the delivery room, but it wasn't my fault because the hospital has all this important dad stuff to do in the receiving area. There's papers to sign. There's insurance to prove. There's sports right on the television. <laughs> so at halftime, when I went up, they'd already prepped her. So I'm looking through the door of the delivery room, and I saw her in there. I said to the doctor, that's my, that's my wife in there having our baby. I've got to get in there and be with her. There she is on the table with all the blood and the rage and the seething hatred. I want to be as close to that as I can possibly get. And the doctor said, well, you can't go in there dressed like that. You've got to put on this, and this is a little blue paper hat. Like you're going to make onion rings and fries and... You gotta wear this little blue paper dress that ties up in the back, incidentally. You gotta wear little blue paper booties. You gotta wear this mask. You gotta wear gloves. All right, we're ready. Let's go. So I'm marching into the delivery room. I saw myself in the mirror. I said, wait a second. I can't go in there looking like this. What would our neighbors say? Inside the delivery room, there's all this high-tech equipment, buttons and switches and doodads, and it's intimidating. I'm looking at all of it, trying to find something I recognize. And finally, up on a shelf in the corner, I spotted a VCR, just like the one in my living room. And their clock was flashing 12, 12. <laughs> I said to the doctor, hey, look, your clock's all messed up. And the doctor said, ah, oh, that thing never has worked right. And then out came the baby. <laughs> and I learned that with all of the stuff that comes out with a child, <laughs> there is a ton of it. <laughs> Nowhere in any of it is there an instruction manual or a pamphlet or a, a PowerPoint presentation. There's <laughs> nothing that indicates what you do with the child afterwards. The nurse just hands it to me. It's a girl. And I was, wow, wow, would you look at, oh, you got to cut that cord? <laughs> I looked into that tiny little face and I realized I'm a father. I've got responsibilities. This little child needs me in order to survive. I looked over at the wife of my youth. And I could already tell by looking at her face that there was no way we would ever be able to take this little person and put her back where she came from. <laughs> I just wasn't ready for all the stuff I was supposed to know. I thought I was. I wasn't. I, I, it just avalanched in, all the dad information. And I knew the babies were coming. You know, I'm not an idiot. I saw the signs. She ate the cat. So I did my own research, you know. I interviewed experts in the field of child care. Other guys in the neighborhood. <laughs> they were a tremendous comfort. John, once the baby arrives, everything in your life is different. Everything changes. Nothing's the same. It's all different. Everything changes. Everything. Like what? Everything. 
You can't use the same laundry detergent as you're using now. You can't use all or cheer anymore. You have to use draft. <laughs> draft, what's that? It's like all or cheer, but it has a picture of a baby on the box. It wasn't until after baby number four that I finally learned everything a father needs to know about childbirth. Epidural. <laughs> it's this little bit of elfin magic right here in our plane of reality. This is how it works. Lori's laboring really hard on the bed with baby number four. Because <laughs> I guess with childbirth, there's some discomfort. And I'm just thrilled to know what she's talking about. Yes, ice, count on it, don't leave. I'm out in the hall operating the ice machine. I come winging back in, here you go, cup of ice. And she goes, get away from me, I didn't ask for ice. At that point, the nurse sticks her head in the door and says, Mr. Brandon, we could bring in an epidural. And I'm in tears, what's that? <laughs> she, she's like, get some ice, get some ice, get the ice. And she's like, well, I don't need ice now. <laughs> And the nurse says, it's something for the pain. And I went, yes, <laughs> bring in the epidural and bring something for her. <laughs> so they push in this cart with a machine on the top of it. It's got a plug and a dial. And then the nurse tells me, seriously, John, you have to leave the room while we administer this. <laughs> Because I guess the epidural is some mystical, secret girl ritual <laughs> that men are forbidden to see, like a Longer Burger basket party. <laughs> so I'm out in the hall for 10 minutes, and the nurse says, okay, it's safe to come back in. So I cautiously sneak back into the room, and my wife, who I'd left suffering on the edge of the bed moments ago, is sitting in the exact same spot smiling <laughs> come here sweetie look at the monitor I'm having a contraction <laughs> little woodland creatures had gathered around the bed They're, she's feeding them oh, oh, oh. The problem with the epidural is they won't let you take it home. <laughs> Boy, that would be handy. Hey, Lori, I'm going to go bowling. <laughs> You'll probably be late. <laughs> so then we bring the babies home, you know, because after just a couple of days, the hospital makes you. And people start asking more questions that I don't have the answers to. Like, is she a good baby? <laughs> How do you tell? You just, you just thump them like a melon? <laughs> what they mean by that question is, does the baby sleep most of the time? And that's what Mandy did, our firstborn. Lori was so proud of her, she told everybody, Ah, oh, this baby is an angel. She sleeps about 18 hours a day. She only wakes up when she's hungry, and as soon as she's fed, she goes right back to sleep. <laughs> so the definition for a good baby is the same definition for a crummy husband. I mean, it's amazing the amount of credit the children get for doing nothing, nothing, when they're little. Every day when they were small, from somewhere in the house, I'd hear, oh, that's the cutest thing I've ever seen. John, come and look at this. You won't believe it. It's so cute. Hurry up. Run, run. Bring the camera. And I'd come flying in. What? What did he do? Look. He rolled over. <laughs> I 
You know what? I would do more around the house if I got those kind of accolades for every little project. (laughs) Everybody stop what you're doing. Come to the bathroom. Look and see what daddy did. Run, 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 run. (laughs) Bring the camera. (laughs) Look, he changed the role. That's not what I thought you were going to (laughs) say. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I love my kids. I can't imagine life without those little people now. Because home, home now for me is a place where I can go and I'm accepted regardless of performance. There's no critics at home. Nobody waiting to pass judgment. It's the opposite. Usually Tabitha, little girl, peering through the front curtains, waiting to see me pull up in the driveway. As soon as she sees the car, she's like, there's Tabitha. She runs and tells the other kids, Daddy's home. They come flying out. By the time I get to the front door, there's a massive celebration happening all over the living room. Daddy's home. Hooray for Daddy. It's the greatest event in human history. They form this little conga line. Daddy, Daddy's home. Ooh, I'm Daddy, Daddy's home. Ah. That hardly happens anywhere else I go. I scoop my son up onto my shoulders. We start to play. I forget about the problems of the day. I forget about troubles. I forget about the ceiling fan. (laughs) (laughs) Lori Andrews crying. I don't know. I think he hit his head. On the coffee table. I just thought after 21 years, I'd have all the answers. You know, I thought I'd have it figured out. I thought I'd know, and I don't. I'm still confused about the function of each individual gender within the relationship. You know, men and women, and women, women mostly. (laughs) Women are supposed to be the weaker sex. That is how they are advertised. (laughs) This makes me the stronger sex. It's a role I have absolutely no idea how to fake. Over the years, I've come up out of desperation with this complex algebraic formula that I'm always running in my head to prove manliness. The more dirt I can get on me, the more manly I seem. That's it. (laughs) So basically, I just look for excuses to get dirty, you know? If you need me, Lori, I'll be out in the front yard today, landscaping. Old man of the house is going to take pick and shovel in hand, put a huge hole right next to the mailbox. You bet you why? Because we don't have a hole next to the mailbox. There's going to be dirt flying up in the air, dirt in my hair, dirt under my fingernails. Don't you worry about me, little lady, because we men love dirt. <laughs> and she let me get the tip of my little finger in the contents of a dirty diaper. <gasps> Poo-poo poisoning. <laughs> and from time to time, from time to time, our two-year-old will come sailing into a room, just <laughs> oblivious to the big green thing swinging back and forth under his nose. It's everywhere. It's got a life of its own, just back and forth. I'm up on the sofa. <laughs> Lori comes running in. What's the matter? What are you screaming about? That? (sighs) Come here, Andrew. She takes her bare hand. (laughs) Mommy, get that for you. (laughs) I'm gone. (laughs) Then she goes and makes meatloaf. That is not the weaker sex. I wouldn't do that with an oven mitt. 
And women are the disciplinarians in the family. It's not dad, that whole scary, wait till your father gets, wait till your father gets home. Why? <laughs> so we can all hear him say, I don't know. What did your mother say? I had no idea when I was a kid. I figured this out watching Lori. Women are the disciplinarians because they have an ability. They have a, a God-given talent for taking common, everyday household items and turning them into weapons. <laughs> she never has to look for a belt or paddle. She just goes, what have I told you kids about doing that in the house? This will work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your mother, Luke. <laughs> and women, women have even figured out a way to fuse discipline and gift giving into one event. When I was little, my brother and I actually got the paddleball game for Christmas. <laughs> that is the worst disguise ever. That had to originate with some dad. Some male thought that up. I can just hear him somewhere in history. Hey, hey, I got an idea. <laughs> this year, let's give each of the boys a paddle for Christmas. What do you think? <laughs> Mom said, no, that won't work. They'll catch on. Here, we'll staple a rubber band with a ball in the middle of it. Now it's a game. It's not a game for kids. Kids can't even do it. The only one in the family who can even do it is mom. My mom could flip us over one leg, blast our rear ends, and keep the ball going. This is hurting me a lot more than it's hurting you, boy. And in the midst of all of it, in the midst of unanswered questions and low self-esteem and confusion of roles and kids flying around the planet, in the middle of all the chaos, I'm still expected to be romantic. <laughs> I'm still expected to breathe new wind on the embers of romance. She will appear from nowhere. Take me someplace. <laughs> Take me someplace nice. Because we never go anywhere. That's why we just stay home all the time. And I don't want to stay home all the time. I want to go someplace with you. I want to go out somewhere with you. So take me someplace. Take me someplace nice. <laughs> all right. Where do you want to go? to take me that would ruin everything you have to think of some place to go yeah. so I got tickets to the tractor pull and that was wrong We have so many friends whose cummerbunds match the flowers, match the dresses, and they march down the aisle. They took a vow, a vow, until death do us part. And then they parted. And they weren't dead. I think love takes longer than that. It takes a lifetime. It takes a whole lifetime to learn how to love another person, figure out what makes them happy, what brings them deep, sincere joy, to learn what really annoys them, so you can do it again and again and again. <laughs> if you stick with it, eventually you'll zero in on the source of conflict. You'll figure out what it is that causes the two of you to fight. Lori and I did. It's me. <laughs> it's 
I remember the first, I remember the first fight that I caused. It was right after we got married. And I wanted to go out with the guys, you know, just me and the guys like we used to for old time's sake. And she wanted me to stay there with her and cut the cake and throw the bouquet. And, you know. <laughs> and even now, sometimes she'll get me backed into a corner, maneuvered, so I can't escape. And she'll say, John, listen, sweetie, I was just reading in Cosmo. Cosmo, great. <laughs> Bring it on. If you could start all over again, if you could wipe the slate clean. Hey, look at me. This is important. <laughs> if you could start all over again and wipe the slate clean, start afresh, would you get married again? <laughs> the speed with which you answer that question is as important as the answer itself. <laughs> And the truth is, after 21 years, the answer to that question is yes. I would, I would marry the exact same girl again. Because what I've learned over these years is that the two of us together are somehow better than the sum of the individual parts. And she is so many things I could never be. And I'm so many things that she doesn't want to be. <laughs> it's complimentary. We haven't mastered it. We're still learning, both of us. I'm learning, she's learning. I'm learning that she's like a, like a flower, a flower with infinite petals. And each petal is a little more complex and a little more lovely than the petal that preceded it. And it's going to take a lifetime to examine every subtle nuance, every tiny little facet of her personality that makes her unique and special, different from all the rest, and beautiful. And she's learning that every guy on the planet is exactly the same. <laughs> You might as well just stick with me, baby. That's all there is. <laughs> I know her better than I know anybody else on the planet. She's my other half. I know, I know her favorite color. I know how she looks in the morning. I know her shoe size. I know how she cooks. Beep, beep. It's an ancient family recipe. <laughs> For microwave popcorn? That's... Family recipe is this side up. <laughs> I know how she drives. Wow. <laughs> She's got this motto, Well, we pay for insurance, we might as well use it. <laughs> She does stuff with insurance I could never do. She hit a deer. She once hit a deer that was already dead in the middle of the... <laughs> Tore the running board off the car, knocked the wheels all out of alignment. She was so upset. I'm sorry, Johnny. Didn't hit him on purpose. Hmm. I didn't get mad. I couldn't get mad. Because you know those deer crossing signs by the road? They always show the deer like this. <laughs> it never shows them like this. <laughs> And late at night on long trips, when I'm driving, she'll sit up front with me and she'll go, well, it's late at night on long trip. You're probably pretty tired, aren't you? Because it's late at night on long trip. <laughs> so I'll just sit up front with you and keep you company, help you stay awake. Mm. <laughs> Five miles down the road, but she's sound asleep. <laughs> so this is what I do. Pull into the first rest park that I come to where the semis are idling with their lights on. Pull nose to nose with the semi. Throw the car in neutral. Hit the gas and go, ah! But you know what happened after the wedding cake was eaten and the flowers wilted, all the thank yous have been sent out? 
after that, after the wedding, then real life settled in. And real life, I mean, day-to-day life is hard and it's mundane and it doesn't feel the way it feels when you're planning a big wedding. It doesn't feel the way it feels when you're dating. Someday it doesn't feel like it's worth it. And every time those feelings come over me, I have these memories of my great-grandparents, great-grandpa Frank, Mamie. When we were little, we'd go over to their house, my brother and I, and great-grandpa Frank would sit in a big overstuffed chair by the window. We'd stand right in front of him, and he'd lean forward in that chair and talk with his hands and tell us all the stuff that little boys are supposed to know. You know, he taught us how to bait a hook and cast a line so the big fish would hit. Taught us how to build a tree house up in the branches so the floor wouldn't sag, roof wouldn't leak. Taught us how to sit on the handlebars of our bikes and ride them backwards, downhill. <laughs> with groceries. And all afternoon in the rocking chair right next to him was my great-grandmother, Mamie. She'd have her hands in her lap and she'd rock back and forth and look over at him while he talked and she'd shake her head and roll her eyes and she would laugh at the same jokes that she'd heard him tell a billion times before. In the middle of a story, he'd look over, pat her on the knee, wink at her, jump right back in and never miss a beat. And as years went by, we started to notice that Mamie was having trouble remembering things like recipes that used to come from her heart the names of the neighbors that lived right next door. So my great-grandfather's job became to just be with Mamie constantly, make sure she didn't forget something important like unplugging an iron or shutting off the stove, but she got worse. And pretty soon she was more than he could handle all by himself. He was too old, so they had to move out of their house and into a nursing home. And I remember the time that we went to visit the nursing home, dinner time. Great-grandpa Frank sat across the table from Mamie. His plate sat over to the side, got cold. Well, he took one spoonful at a time from her plate and fed it to her. And he'd smile at her, he'd wink, take a napkin, wipe her chin. Maybe, maybe couldn't operate buttons or zippers or shoelaces. So at bath time, he'd have to walk her down the hall, close the door behind him. He'd help her get undressed. He'd gingerly set her down in the tub. And as he maneuvered the sponge for her, he kept his hand behind her back the whole time. And he'd lift her out and he'd dry her off. And maybe... Couldn't, couldn't use the toilet by herself. So every time she had to go, he'd take her in and help her with all of those responsibilities every single time. And during all of those years when he was doing that, we never heard him complain. He never once snapped and said, you know what? I'm an old man, and I've had a long, tough life too, and now I can't even blink with Mamie around because if I do, she may wander off or she'll fall and hurt herself, and I have to feed her, I have to bathe her, I have to take her to the toilet. He never complained. Then there was a day that my brother and I went to visit, nursing home. Great-grandpa Frank sat in his big overstuffed chair. We stood right in front of him, a lot taller this time. And he went into the same stories, how to catch the fish, ride the bicycles, build a treehouse. But this time the rocking chair was empty. And Mamie wasn't there. Because she was back in their room, flat on her back, catatonic. My grandfather stopped his story, looked up at the two of us and said, You know, boys... And there was a tear right here. He said, Mamie, Mamie doesn't know who I am anymore. And that was the first complaint that I ever heard him speak about his little bride. It didn't seem to bother him to be with her constantly. It didn't bother him to have to feed her and bathe her and take her to the restroom. What broke his heart was when all of those times were over. The two of them were married for 70 years, 70 anniversaries with the same person and I am positive that after all of those decades she was not the same girl that he married she didn't look the same they didn't do the things they used to do when they were young and strong she couldn't even remember who he was but there's no doubt that my grandfather was still crazy in love with her because love is not what you feel love is what you do Here, why don't you have this? Your number? Why? I don't know. I thought I should do something sensitive. (laughs) All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, man. Hey, hon. It's, It's me. No, I'm... Still down here getting my license renewed. You know, you got to have your driver's license renewed every four years. But you don't have to have your marriage license renewed ever. Isn't that interesting? No, I'm not leaving you. 
No, no, listen, listen, honey. I, I met a guy down here at the BMV and, and we talked. We really bonded. No, I didn't get his name. <laughs>